Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. I'm Brenda Blackman. I am a domestic violence uh, survivor and also founder of the Brenda Blackman Project. Um, this initiative is designed to help us break through the silence of domestic violence and really bring the conversation forward. Um, the title of the discussion is Living in the Black and it's, it's entitled that because if we recognize that it's happening in our communities, our schools, or our homes, and we don't do anything, then we're actually accepting it. And in my opinion, we're just as responsible for the consequences. So it's really critical for us to talk about this and not continue to brush it under the rug. Um, silence is deadly. Uh, if we know it's occurring, we need to reach out to the appropriate individuals and, and take steps to stop the violence. So what we'll do this evening is uh, dig deeper into what's being done in the Evansville community to stop the cycle of domestic violence. Uh, we have an esteemed group of panelists, and I'll introduce them briefly in a minute. You do have their bios on the table, so uh, you can refer to the bios if you want to know more information or if you want to ask a question as we move uh, into the panel discussion. Um, our panelists will answer questions uh, regarding four topics, okay? Uh, the first will be prevention efforts. Uh, the second will be the role of the church, um, community service, and protection as it relates to domestic violence. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panelists. We have uh, Mary Watson. She is the shelter director at the YWCA. She has 25 years of experience with uh, working with adults uh, in chronic or mental illness, as well, as well as developmental disabilities and substance abuse. Uh, we also have Leslie James. She is a uh, crisis response advocate uh, at the Albion Fellows Bacon Center, and she provides uh, crisis counseling, safety planning, and legal advocacy. Uh, we have Trudy Rasco. She is the First Lady of Nazarene Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, she is a registered nurse and inspires and impacts lives throughout the Evansville community. We also have uh, Brandy Watson. She uh, has been providing peer counseling uh, and legal advocacy as well as medical advocacy, uh, crisis intervention, and support group facilitation for survivors at the Albion Fellows Bacon Center. Uh, we also have on the panel is uh, Bill Braun. He's a police officer with the Evansville Police Department. He's been on the force for 27 years and has worked uh, for 11 years in the domestic violence and sexual violence unit. Uh, we also have Anna Fernerty. She's an attorney and she's prosecuted over 200 domestic violence cases uh, over the, uh, the past year in Vanderbilt County. So, um, just a few housekeeping rules before we actually get into the questions. Um, there is a survey on your table. Uh, please take the time to fill out that survey and when you've completed it, you can just leave it on the table. Um, I would like the panelists to answer the four questions first. You guys can take notes and if you do have questions, write them down and we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, once the panelists have spoke on the four topics. Um, the first question uh, involves uh, prevention efforts, and I'm going to open it up to anybody on the panel. Um, the Evansville Police Department uh, actually publishes uh, an annual web report uh, every year uh, for their domestic violence and sexual assault unit. And this information that I'm going to share with you This information that I'm going to share with you um, comes from the, the 2013 annual web report, okay, and it involves felony cases. So the report shows that there were 450 total uh, felony uh, domestic violence cases, or, or 450 total felony cases, of which 177 were domestic violence. So it's about 39% of the cases were domestic violence related. So the question is, um, if you could talk about your domestic violence prevention program and also describe specific action steps that are in place 
to prevent repeat offenders? Uh, you know, thinking about that question, I don't know that the police department has any particular prevention programs. Uh, we, we speak at, uh, at various events, this being one. We have uh, Citizens Academy in the spring and then again in the fall. And again, I'm a part of that and the domestic violence unit and then uh, Detective Turpin, he, uh, he comes and he speaks about the sex crimes aspect of the, of the unit. Um, this year we'll do a Latino Outreach Academy. And again, it's the same, it's the same concept there uh, that we speak about what we do and how we handle the cases. Police department, like a lot of stuff, like a lot of other crimes, we're, we're more reactive more than proactive. Yeah. We, we come in after the fact. We don't do a lot of you know, prevention type programs. Uh, but we, we do do, uh, like I said, we speak at various, various community events and we do, uh, we do domestic violence follow-ups. But again, that is even, that's reactive, that's after the fact. Okay, so I'd like to ask uh, some of the folks from either the Albion Fellows Baby Center or the YWCA, what do you have in place that's more uh, proactive in terms of uh, helping those who may be offenders uh, from repeating uh, domestic violence incidents uh, in their home or wherever they may occur? Well, <clears throat> At the YWCA, I, uh, myself and Chris, uh, Chris Lothamer, she's a legal advocate, we do the Batters Intervention Program for women right now, and that's for women who have been court ordered to our group because they were convicted of domestic violence. It's a 26-week group, and you're only allowed to be absent uh, twice. Uh, and we teach them about how to handle conflict in a non-abusive manner. A lot of times the ladies in the group are there because they retaliated after many, many years of being abused. But, you know, abuse is abuse no matter who's doing it and they are convicted like everybody else is. So, um, right now we have about nine people that are coming into the group and I just did orientation with three yesterday so our group is growing. Okay. And we're hoping we can do another group by the end of the year for men. Okay, good. Now, do you find that um, repeat offenders um, are mostly men? I know in the case you just described, this was kind of a retaliation situation where it happened several times and the women fought back, if you will. But right. are there cases where it's just point blank, the abuser uh, is a male and I think for the that. most part, history, you know, history has it that, you know, it's, it's been uh, mainly the males, but I think some of that is because some of the males are afraid to come forward. But because of, you know, the uh, male privilege in different cultures and because of how society has set it up, that men more or less have been the ones that have most of the authority, I think that it's, it's been a majority of the people. Of the, of the abusers have been men. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's more because the women now are saying, no, that's not okay. Uh, domestic violence is a learned pattern of behavior, so they've learned the tools that they were, that they were, that they were used against them to um, use against their abusers, so. Okay, interesting. Any other comments related to uh, prevention? Go ahead. I would just expand briefly upon what Detective Brown was saying. He referenced the follow-up program, and both Albion and the Y have, in partnership with the Evansville Police Department, this follow-up program where we are responding to homes where domestic violence is occurring but has not yet reached the level of uh, an arrest being able to be made. And so we're going back into those homes and separating the parties and providing information, education, ser services, um, making kind of an introduction to our agencies and talking to people about potential outcomes, trying to prevent this situation from expanding into a potential felony arrest, trying to get those couples access to resources before things continue to escalate. Awesome. awesome. 
and uh, if everybody else has talked, I'm going to take prevention in a slightly different direction because one of the things that we've begun to do at Albion is try and do what we call primary prevention. That is that we try and get in at the middle school and the high school level and begin to educate kids about safe dating practices and healthy relationships before domestic violence occurs because oftentimes um, by the time we reach our adult relationships, we've already been engaged in those domestic violence relationships all the way at the onset of our dating experiences and oftentimes in our family of origins as well. Um, so one of the strategies that we're trying to do is to get into the middle schools and the high schools and do a multi-session evidence-based program that is now looking at the public health model to try and change um, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors around dating practices so that we can potentially prevent domestic violence from happening in the first place. We don't even have to decide how we're going to prevent perpetration after it's happened. We're trying to get in before it's occurred and get kids talking about this at the onset of their dating behaviors so that we can potentially stem off any domestic violence before it occurs in the first place. Absolutely. So now are the teenagers receptive to open discussion and are they sharing stories? Have they actually experienced it even though you're coming in to mm -hmm. help with prevention, do they share those types of stories? Absolutely. And one of the things that they do in the Safe Dates program is they put out a question box and it, um, over 10 weeks of getting to know the kids, the kids get very open about sharing the questions that they have um, around dating, around sexuality, around a lot of the topics that we would consider dating practices. And it is always amazing what's on their brains and shocking that that's sitting there on their brains and they're not asking an adult and this is giving them a free opportunity to have access to somebody. They, The two ladies that run that program, they bring those questions back. All the office gets involved in answering it. We do a little research to make sure that we're giving them the very best possible information with a lot of thought thrown back at them so that it continues the dialogue and it continues the discussion. Once we leave a school, we leave behind a pre and post test that shows just how much shift in attitude, beliefs, and behaviors that has happened in the time that we were there. And we leave behind all of those questions that the students ask along with the answers so that the school begins to get a better idea on what that population is dealing with too. So it opens up a larger dialogue, which is what primary prevention is all about. It doesn't just start with education in the schools. We're also doing strategies with families. How do you talk to your kids about domestic violence, dating violence, dating practices in general? Um, we just want to get dialogue started not just at that individual level but the community level and the societal level because that's how we prevent, according to the public health model, that's how we go about preventing it in the first place. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, Brandy. Um, so this next question uh, uh, is related to an article from uh, Essence Magazine uh, regarding the myths around the topic domestic violence. The, the article was written by uh, Sherera Jackson. And so uh, the recent article cited uh, three myths about domestic violence. The first one is abuse happens to certain types of women. Uh, I'm too smart for that. It will never happen to me. That's one of the myths. Another myth is you know, I'm gonna leave that to them. If I say anything, I'll get hurt. I don't wanna get involved. Now, that's another myth cited in this particular uh, article. And then the third one is, it's between the couples. You know, they'll, they'll work it out, they'll handle it. The question is, um, talk about a little bit more of your community uh, intervention services, uh, things that you've organized for the public to help them to feel more comfortable getting involved or maybe you know, calling the police if they suspect something. Uh, what's being done to help the community at large feel more comfortable intervening? And I'll open it up to any of the panelists. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll revert back again to, uh, to the programs that we do go out to and, and the organizations that we speak to in that you know, we stress that Domestic violence is is not acceptable, and if they they hear or see it, they should you know they absolutely should call in and uh, and report that. And <clears throat> going back and hitting on your topic of um, it, it only happens to certain types of people, be that poor people, rich people, smart people, dumb people, whatever. 
I can I dispel that myth using my analogy of, of how you boil a frog, if, if you all have heard that before. Uh, this is something that happens over time. If you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water, it jumps back out. It doesn't like it. Uh, if I take you on a first date and I reach across the table and I hit you in the head, there's not going to be a date two. You know, I've exposed you to something too fast. So what I do is, is I expose you to it a little bit gradually over time. And pretty soon, it's, it's like putting the frog in a pot of nice, comfortable water and then turning the stove up. You know, the temperature slowly rises and before you know it, the frog is boiled. The frog didn't realize it, but he's boiled. The same thing with, with domestic violence. It, it happens a little bit over time. And before the individual knows it, they're, they're in a situation and they're thinking, how did I get here? What happened? Why me? It, it's something that happens over time to anybody. It doesn't matter, like I said, rich or poor, or, you know, smart or not. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. And I've found that uh, once the pattern is built, it, it is surprising. But even prior to that, there are subtle signs that, you know, maybe just a toe in the boiling water, to use your analogy, yeah. or the elbow, and you're like, well, that didn't really happen. So you don't pay attention to those signs. Right. You don't react appropriately. And sometimes we let that pattern become a pattern. So there are things that we need to do early on to um, stop the, the cycle, prevent the cycle. And, okay. at, uh, our, at Nazarene, what we have in place, and I'm sure most churches do too, is but we have like teen groups, we have a sister to sister group that meets and they talk about different topics and that is one of the topics they deal with. We, we have teen lock-ins where we deal, the last one we had, we dealt specific, specifically with sexual issues. Um, as far as prevention, which um, I think is really important in the, in the church is we lift up the standards of God and uh, we stress to people what a true believer in Christ is because if you're a believer, God has a standard set up that you should not marry or date someone that's an unbeliever. And God has placed safeguards already in his word that if we would take heed to those safeguards that he set, a lot of things would not go that far. Um, he set safeguards like making, you know, passing the date through your parents, um, don't be unevenly yoked. Um, he has um, what to do if people are mistreated. And I know uh, throughout the years it's been silence. We even have biblical stories. Uh, Tamar, when she was raped by her brother, and how King David treated, I mean, we have examples throughout the Word of God on what to do, how David was silent and silent on that issue. And, and how that affected Tamar. And so we have examples, and so what we try to do is teach the standards that God has and, and show what a true Christian is like. And it's nothing but the word of God that's gonna change a person and uh, get them uh, to submit to, to, to be more like him. And that's what we stress in, in the churches. Awesome, thank you. Any other comments? Um, regarding uh, prevention efforts or uh, intervention? I guess I just kind of wanted to say that we also, uh, I know Alvin and I attend, uh, with the YWCA attend uh, meetings and, and with uh, USI, and there's their domestic violence and sexual assault task force there, and in, in, um, do also the, the walking in their own shoes in that. It just promotes a lot of visual, visual activities and participa participation with, with students and the, the whole community. And I think that that's really a great thing that, that we're able to do, that you guys are able to do. Yeah, honestly, the issue won't stop until we become a community of advocates, until we're all advocating for the end of it, and until we stand up and we have discussions about it and we call situations for what they are and we talk to each other about it in a safe way. Awesome. All right, so um, Trudy, uh, this might piggyback on what you just spoke about, but the, the next question involves the church. So the Bible states that uh, God has joined together uh, 
what, what God has joined together, let man not separate, and this comes from the book of Matthew, um, what is your opinion of the church and its role in dealing with the prevention of domestic violence? For example, uh, separation of bed and board as it relates to domestic violence. Um, it's so funny, because I text you, I had never heard that term, separation of bed and board, before. And so I text Brenda and found out what it meant, and then I Googled it, of course, and found out all kind of legal stuff. It's basically what we call legal separation. And um, I think uh, what the church, how that came about, I see it, it's not really done much from what I understand from Googling it um, anymore, but it was predominantly done in the Catholic faith uh, because they had a very firm belief that once you're married, you're, you're in it for life. And so I think what they did is looked it up, the 1 Corinthians chapter 7 passage, where it talks about if a wife does leave, she is to remain unmarried, and he, she nor he could ever remarry. But the hope was that they would get reconciled. And I'm thinking possibly that's where that bed and board came from. And so, um, but the Catholics do, God is serious about marriage. He established it in Genesis. He wants it to be permanent. That's the original plan. And when we look at that Matthew passage, what happens is the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus and uh, trick him. And they're asking him this question about marriage. And he explains to them, he takes them right back to Genesis. He explains to them, look, God's original purpose is that it be permanent. But because of the hardness of your heart, you won't treat people right. You're not going to do right. Moses is a, lets you out. But he gives specific reasons uh, that a person can get out of a marriage biblically and be correct. Now, um, I know we live in a day a lot of people have divorced, and God is a God of forgiveness, and, and he will forgive you. But there are specific guidelines in the word of God on who can be divorced, who can remarry, and you can find that in the word of God. Any other comments on that? I think, um, and this is uh, when I was first starting into domestic violence uh, back some time ago, I think um, there was some kind of conflict between the churches and what we were trying to accomplish with victims because the churches were saying you, um, and I should, you know, Catholic Church in particular was saying you should stay married mm -hmm. and um, let's let's counsel them both in, in their marriage problems and it's it wasn't a, a marriage problem it was a problem that he was having uh, against her um, but I think they've come a ways with that and I think the counseling is I think they they're speaking more understanding um, as we have gone on more education in the churches um, I should say Catholic Church um, about what's really going on and understanding that this isn't the woman's problem, it's, it's the man's problem, um, if, that, if the abuse is against the woman. Um, and so I think we've come a long way from when I first kind of started into this and to the education part of educating the churches on there are times mm -hmm. when the marriage needs to end. And, so. I, and I think that there, through, through the years, there's been a lot, lot of misunderstanding of the biblical principles mm -hmm. as, at, in regard to the ministers and, and in regard to people as a whole. They did not take time to correctly understand what God's standard was and, and the reasons he would allow you out. God does not want anybody to be in a situation where they're being mistreated. Mm -hmm. he, wants, he wants you safe and he wants you out. And it's the church's responsibility although we've not done the best in the past, but it is the church's responsibility to take care and keep people in that situation safe. So, so just to clarify, if abuse is occurring in a marriage, um, the standards of God really cite that you should work it out and the couple should immediately separate or divorce, that they should, you should go to counseling, you know, talk through the issue, find out, you know, what is, what is happening and why, and work things out. And Good and biblical counseling, okay, yeah. Good, good, solid counseling, okay. yeah. Um, the hope is reconciliation. That's the hope, That's the hope. but it's not always possible. You know what's and, interesting, and, I'll tell uh -huh. you a story. Uh, you know, I am divorced, and uh, again, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, and my ex-husband, I mean, he's a great guy, but um, I 
could no longer be married in that situation, and he worked very hard to reconcile. And he's from um, the Pentecostal church, and you know, family, everybody's close knit. And I was even advised by some of the other family members, you know, while I was going through the situation to work it out. But uh, yeah, he and he and I, when he was trying to reconcile, I uh, I was against it. Just Red based flags. On, just you based have, yeah. on, yeah. you know, that experience. So. Yeah, this is my personal testimony. Um, okay, so the last question relates to uh, protection. Um, so in many domestic violence or sexual assault cases, the victim is reluctant to press charges. And this is typically um, due to fear or even lack of knowledge of the domestic violence laws. If you could describe um, uh, and this really pertains to Mary, Leslie, uh, and Brandy, uh, describe your relationship with the city officials, police officers like Bill, uh, in terms of how you're partnering with them to actually stop uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. So more on the partnership, like what is your organization doing to collaborate and you know, uh, improve the, the situation? We have a great collaborative partnership with uh, law enforcement, both Evansville Police Department and the Vanderbilt County Sheriff's Office, uh, local prosecutor's office as well. So for example, we have a domestic violence cross county team. We meet bi-weekly at the prosecutor's office and we look at issues that our clients might be having. How, are, how is law enforcement responding? What issues are we hearing repeatedly from our clients? Any concerns that they might have about how cases are being handled? We get together bi-weekly and talk about those things and try to make sure that we are providing the best possible services for, for those people. We have um, an enforcement treatment subcommittee uh, that many of us sit on as well as an uh, education and collaboration subcommittee, both subcommittees of the Mayor's Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence where we see a lot of our community partners, Albion, the Y, the Prosecutor's Office, law enforcement all represented where we're coming together monthly again to address these issues issues. How are we enforcing domestic violence laws as a community? What type of education and support services are available to victims? Uh, through the, a partnership with both Albion and the Y and the prosecutor's office, we teach a class that is a domestic violence education class. It is support and education for victims of domestic violence who have come forward and said that they don't want to pursue charges. They want the charges against their partner dismissed. If the court has put a no contact order in place, maybe they've come forward and they've asked a judge to dismiss that no contact order because they're trying to reconcile, they want to keep this relationship intact. The court system actually refers those people to a domestic violence education class so that they can learn about the law, they can learn about their legal rights, they can learn about services that are available to them support services and they can make an informed decision about how they wish to proceed with that criminal case. Any other comments from the panelists? Um, we also, I also have a representative from the Y or Albion, they switch every other week uh, because I have my domestic trials on Wednesday mornings. Um, they will come and, and assist me because I will have lots of cases going on during that morning. Um, if there's any victims that are present for the trials, they'll come, uh, talk with them, sit with them so that they don't feel uncomfortable and sitting in the courtroom and have no one to sit with or uh, feeling intimidated. Um, so I do, I get a lot of assistance uh, from the Y and from Albion. At helping prosecute cases and the classes um, we refer a lot of people there um, that come in and even if they're not there to, to get the no contact order uh, dropped uh, I still always give out the slip for the classes so that they have those numbers available to them um, so those are the questions um, that I had for the panelists now I'd like to open it up to the audience. If you guys have any questions or comments uh, for any of the panelists, uh, I just ask that you speak loudly. What 
What's your name? I'm, I'm sorry, my name is Christy Burns. Can you speak up a little bit? I certainly can. Um, question number three, um, if a family member, neighbor, or co-worker were to, to be in a domestic violence situation and ask, would you offer help? I certainly would, but it would be beneficial to know how to go about doing that. So if any of the panelists might be able to speak about what, what can you do to help when you see this occurring and where do you go to get the necessary help to protect yourself as well as help the person that, that is in need? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, you know, I tell people if you if you want to help, first of all, don't be judgmental. Don't uh, don't offer them advice. In other words, you you're there to support them and to help them in any way you can, but not to be judgmental. You can't. Uh, you never know what a person is going through until you've lived in their house or walked in their shoes. So that's, to me, that, that's always first and foremost is don't ju be judgmental. And, and let them know if you have a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, and you want to help, first of all, tell them that you are there to help them and that if they need your help, all they have to do is ask. And if they need a safe place to go and you're willing to open your door, that would be great. You know, let them know that if you ever need to get out and need to get away, um, that, that you can come, you know, to your house or my house, whoever, wherever. Um, that's, I think that's, that's, the first, that's the first step. Uh, as far as if, if you were to, to witness it or hear it, then I definitely think it need, you know, you should call in. And definitely, there's no question there. That, that you should call in uh, because domestic violence, uh, as I said earlier, usually starts out with small little things. And if you're, if you're a witness to it, then that abuser has taken it to the next level. He's no longer afraid to do it in public where it can be seen. That's a big red flag, so you definitely need to call the police and let us know. Does that help? Also, if you're, once you are calling the police and letting them know what you've heard, once we get involved, we can, we have all this set up to where they can um, be referred to the Y, to the Albion, and, and know all the resources that are out there. Um, but we need that information to get it all started. And if you're not witness to something, but somebody comes to you and tells you that this situation is going in, because we do find ourselves in that role sometimes as well, it's important not to assume that that person is telling you everything that's happened. A lot of times when a client, uh, when a victim comes forward, they tell you just a little bit about what's happening to test you, to see if they can trust you and your reactions. So I'm in complete agreement and not, not making judgments there, um, but it does mean we should hold our tongues either. That sounds really scary. That sounds like a very overwhelming situation. That's helping that victim to place a framework around it because they may be very confused and upset and not sure how to frame the situation either. Avoiding giving advice is also very excellent. Instead, um, pointing them towards resources, continuing to keep an open door to talk to them. If you don't feel safe intervening in that situation, which is oftentimes not a safe place to be be in. Um, we, we talk to what we call secondary victims. That's anybody who comes in contact with somebody who's experiencing this all the time. I was on the phone just today with a mom talking about a friend of her daughter's who had revealed to her daughter that this was going on, coming up with strategies on how to provide that person with some information without, you know, overwhelming them or making them run away, but keeping that open door because oftentimes, you know, the victim loves this person and the victim is struggling to try and figure out what their next choices and options are. And that's really what they need is to know what their options are so that they can make the right choice for themselves, even if it's returning again to that situation, which can be very hard and very frustrating when you see how dangerous the situation is and the person chooses to continue to return to that situation. 
but we each have to follow a process and leaving very much as a process. For many victims, they may try and leave seven to nine times before they leave for good. So it is a process to try and get out of these situations. And if you want to engage in that process with somebody, you have to engage in it with patience. And sometimes you need support for yourself as you're engaging in that process. And so that's absolutely something that we can do is talk those situations out and help people see all the options and choices that are in front of them. And whatever that choices that victim makes is the right one for her, even if it's returning to a situation. She has more evidence, knowledge, whatever that she wants to gain before she's ready to make the choice to leave that situation. And that's her right to do that. But we can continue to be that neutral resource. And I think that's so important for us to do as a community is to try not to judge and to be that neutral resource for people. Any other questions for the panelists? I have a question. Oh. I'm, I'm a little shy, but I'll ask you. <laughs> uh, you know, when you hear about these situations, like in your situation, it went on over a period of time. And so, you know, my assumption is that in a lot of these uh, situations that that person, the abuser, has come in contact with the law several times, possibly throughout this process. I'm just wondering if Bill can speak to maybe what that process is like with her question. If, if I witness something and I call the police, what, what's that process happen? Because ultimately what it looks like is that even if that happens, this guy's walking away and, and this happens again and then he goes he walks away and this happens again. And so to try to pinpoint where is an area where something needs to be stronger or or, or bigger in order to stop that process. Cause you know, I know, you know, God is a God of mercy, you know, me not so much. But, <laughs> but I mean, I, so, but I'm, I'm just you know, like, you know, what does that process look like? I call the police, I've seen this, I'm, I'm this concerned citizen, I'm stepping up and you know, rather than me go get my guys and we do it, we call you. Mm -hmm. What happens to you? <laughs> well, you know, the bottom line to a lot of this, it, it boils down to, and I know everyone here has heard it, is you can only help those that want to help themselves. So if, if you, if in your example, if you call the police and you see the police come out and something, and you're, you're not sure what's going on, and then they leave and you're like, what? What's, what, what's that all about? First of all, they, someone should have talked to you, okay, to, to find out what exactly you witnessed. And if the officer had probable cause to make an arrest based on the, his investigation, then an arrest should have been made. If an arrest is not made, then that officer still has to take a report and he's got to document why he didn't make an arrest. Now, I can tell you as, as a 911 caller, he's probably not, the officer's probably not going to come back to you and tell you why he didn't make an arrest. But if he does, he should come to you and let you know and find out what you saw and add that to his report to start with. Um, that's that's kind of how this goes. And if he doesn't make an arrest, again, he still has to make a report and document why he didn't make that arrest. And again, if he didn't make an arrest, if, if you saw something that warranted calling the police and an arrest wasn't made, there's a good chance that she didn't tell the whole story. Uh, or there's some other circumstance as to why the, the arrest wasn't made. Uh, but a report's always generated, or, or it's supposed to always be generated. Does that, does that help? Yeah, you? I'm just thinking, so if I, if, I, if I see something, and I call 911, I call the police, they get there and she doesn't want to press charges. Uh -huh. So then nothing happens. It depends. If, if, okay. if you watched her if you watched him punch her in the in the head and they show up and she's got a black eye and they interview you and you said I saw this and she goes no that's not what happened I fell down the steps then they're gonna have to again look at everything that happened and, and, and put all the evidence they have together and decide if there's enough there to make an arrest and if there is they're supposed to make one and if they don't regardless of the circumstance they're supposed to take they're supposed to take a report and if, if you see that and an, ar an arrest isn't made and you think, well, gosh, they, last week they were out here and cops didn't do anything and now here it's happening again, 
you know what, I'm not even going to call this time because they never do anything. D don't get that attitude. And I say that about any crime. Call again. Keep calling in. I always told people when I worked the street, any, any problem, any neighborhood problem that's going on, if you're getting frustrated with it, keep calling. Because sooner or later, the officer that has to keep coming out, coming out, coming out, is going to finally have to do something to deal with that problem. Because he's getting tired of coming out. So, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, so to speak. So keep, don't, don't let a, a non-arrest discourage you. Keep calling each time. So, uh, just one more piece on if, if, So, if this call is made, all this happens, and there's an arrest made, in your experience, is the sentencing for that arrest substantial enough to help deter you know, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, if he's going to be arrested in there, I'll say, now don't you do that again. And he spends a night in jail, he goes home. Well, he, you know, the, there's a, they, have, they have to hold him for so many hours per, per Indiana law, and uh, then they get out. That's, Indiana calls it a cooling off period, and it's also a, they have to stay in there long enough, and that also gives her time to maybe put her thoughts together, put some belongings together, and get out. But uh, as far as sentencing goes, you're, you're, you're asking a guy that, that thought when the new jail was being built, I got a whole list of guys that ought to be put under the jail, the jail built over the top of them so they never see the light of day again. So, you know, we just we keep putting them in and the system, you know, they, they just eventually get back out and most of the time upend again, unfortunately. That's well, what we try to do, you know, with our misdemeanors, uh, domestic batteries, um, our goal would be first of all, to get the conviction because um, it's enhanceable to a felony if it happens again. So that, that's our first goal. The second part is, uh, depending on the circumstances and the person, we want to get them into the batter's intervention programs. Um, it's an intensive program, 26 weeks like they were describing. Um, you have to go to it every week. Um, you have to participate into it. Um, and I, I think it's a good program for them to have to go through. But that's, so we kind of have different goals in mind. Um, sometimes the, the programs do work with some of the people. Some of the people are, that, that's not appropriate. They, you know, they've been in the program and they've re-offended while in the program. Um, we know that the program's not working for that person. Um, but that's kind of our goal with the, the, the domestic violence and the, and the misdemeanors and getting that. Yeah, so Anna, so did you say earlier that at some point it becomes a felony, like if it's a third, a third offense, second, it a second felony. offense. So, second offense. Right. If they if they are convicted of the domestic violence, the first one that's called in, um, it's enhanceable to a felony. Then, that's correct. You know, the the victims that I interview. The ones that are kind of wishy-washy, do I want to file charge, do I not? I, I really try to stress that, hey, let's at least get this domestic battery, even if he's charged this time with a felony, but he's never, some kind of felony crime, but he's never been charged or been found guilty of domestic battery before. Let's at least maybe get him in there and let him plead down to the misdemeanor battery and get that so that he's got the misdemeanor domestic violence conviction so that the next time he does it, it's an automatic felony that he's charged with a felony each time thereafter. And fear is a motivator for a lot of victims to not want to cooperate within that system too because when he gets back out, when this batter gets back out, a lot of times he's very upset now with the victim and he's not taking responsibility for his actions. He's blaming responsibility for his actions on the victim. It's your fault I went to jail because you called the police. It's your fault I went to jail because you got hurt. You screamed out because a neighbor saw what was happening. You didn't keep the secret. You didn't keep things going the way it was. So that fuels their lack of cooperation with law enforcement too. And that's where law enforcement and advocates become such allies to each other because you know when he's making an interview then we come on over to Holly's house and we talk to the victim and we tell them you know it may not be jail time this time but if you go ahead and you work with this and you work with that then if it happens again you know it's trying to work within the limitations that the system has available to make safety planning a living breathing kind of thing because there are limitations to what the system can do but you have more choices and options safety planning wise 
than just using the law enforcement system and the legal system. There's emotional safety planning things we can do. There are physical safety planning things that we can do. And we can engage in those discussions with the client to help them begin to feel empowered to make choices for their safety, knowing what the limitations of the systems that they're engaging with are. That's why, too, it's important sometimes when you have a witness um, that is called in and is listed in the uh, affidavit, um, because we can, or at least uh, as far as our office goes, we can say, it, you're not my only witness. I've got another witness that I can go forward with this case on. Um, and so that they, they can go back to, to the defendant or their partner and say, I, you know, I talked to them, but they say they have this other witness. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's helpful to get that defendant to the treatment or whatever we need to do with that defendant when there's other witnesses. Yeah. And then she can cooperate because it's safe for her to cooperate. Right. It's not her fault that this is moving forward. Right. And we see that with the class that we teach for people who don't want to pursue prosecution. It's often because they don't feel safe in doing so. It may be safer for them to be able to come back to their partner and say, look, I, I went to this class and I'm, I'm communicating with the prosecutor's office that I don't want to, to move forward with this because in the state of Indiana, it's the state of Indiana that presses charges. It's not the individual person. So the, the cases read the state of Indiana versus whoever the defendant is. And so it affords the victim in those cases some protection to be able to say, look, the state of Indiana is choosing to pursue this, but not me. I have done what I can do to prevent this from happening. And that could potentially help them feel a little bit safer. Because as we've mentioned here, domestic violence in Indiana is a misdemeanor unless there's that prior conviction or if it's happened in the presence of minor children. And so as a misdemeanor charge, if it goes through, it goes through sentencing uh, through court with Anna, uh, the sentence is oftentimes a six month jail sentence suspended, <laughs> meaning they do no jail time on the condition that they attend this batter's intervention program, this intensive 26 week program. So it puts a lot of responsibility then on the defendant to comply with that program so that they are staying out of jail. If they don't go to the counseling, they end up in jail. It's their own fault for not complying, not the fault of the victim who would have otherwise possibly had to testify against them. But batterers don't oftentimes see it that yeah. way. <laughs> Do you guys have stats on uh, the success rate of that program? If they complete it, I mean, the the, the do they often uh, have, you know get arrested again, or what's the success for the rate? batterers the treatment program? program? Mm -hmm. We don't. We don't. The not amends now. program that runs the, the one here in town probably does, because that's where the majority of them um, are referred into. Um, and if you want, I can give you the website for them later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you would like to do some research on it. <laughs> I heard a DB, a domestic violence attorney, speak one time, and he said if domestic violence could have been cured by women, it would have been cured a long time ago. Well. It means men to step up and say to other men, you're treating people wrong. Uh, do you know of any grassroots, and you spoke about the church, any grassroots where the men are actually coming to a man and speaking and saying uh, you're behaving improperly to your wife and your girlfriend? My husband, who is Pastor Larry Rasco, has done a series, well, he's done a sermon, and uh, I've not ever known it to actively happen, but we do have that in place. If, that will, if we need to and we find out about it, we will go and uh, we'll approach uh, the person, um, the brother, um, with a group of brothers. And uh, just like Stanley, um, Mr. Stanley Jackson said, if we have to go and, and gather up a posse, you know, just to show that this is serious, you know? And I don't, he's not ever told me that it's ever been done, which he probably wouldn't anyway because it's a, <laughs> right, <laughs> he probably wouldn't it's anyway. <laughs> right, it's a cold, yeah. <laughs> but um, that that is a, 
that is um, something that will happen at our church that I know of. Is there an ongoing group? It's is under, it one-on-one? yeah, it's, it's probably starts off one-on-one -on -one and then if others have to go, then they take the group. group is called yeah. The guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get the guys. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were throwing the crazy daddy club. <laughs> 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 they don't go to talk. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> We have tons of men that call the hotlines as secondaries looking for information. So I think there are men who are interested in talking. Oftentimes they're in the father role more than any other role when we have a man who calls the hotline. Yeah. But there are men who are interested in talking and wanting to know the right information or wanting to be able to process the information that they're telling the people they care about. And uh, I think that's what it's going to take. Um, um, you'll find a lot of people don't want to be held accountable, and so you will not see them around because of the fact that they don't want to be held accountable. But uh, once we know, then uh, we keep, you know. Yeah. So is there a hotline for, let's say, if a situation happens and a man as an abusive incident toward his wife or girlfriend or whatever, is there a hotline for him to call? Uh, because I don't think it's something that they're happy about. You know, usually we talk about abuse, nobody's happy, there's something wrong, and that's why it's occurring. So is there, like, a we have the victim's hotline, you know, there's three different, four different numbers, but is there one for abuser? that we know of, that we can share with the audience. Not that I'm aware of. Not that, that might I'm be aware. a project for someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Create a, a hotline for abusers. Maybe I could do that. The Birth of Black Project. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, Evansville Police Department, we have a tip line, but as, looking yeah. back, as far as I know, no one's ever called that. We've never received a tip that there's domestic abuse going on in the household. We, we've never, as far as I know, we've never gotten that. Well, and oftentimes they don't take responsibility for a lot of their behaviors. And so I'd be remiss to think that a lot would call the hotline, but I could be wrong just because of the perspective I come from. <laughs> I think that accountability piece is often what's missing because and there's... that largely becomes the problem, doesn't it, is that lack of accountability exactly. on their part. Apologies are always followed with but, and with minimize, deny, and blame, and pass off the reason why so that I don't have to honestly be responsible for the actions I just created. Instead, you nagged me too much. I had a rough childhood. I was drinking, it was work. So if I'm not responsible for those, why would I call a hotline? Because I'm not guilty of it. You're the problem, not me, right? I don't know. Right. Right. Since it doesn't exist, maybe you'd get a lot of calls, who knows? <laughs> And the White Ribbon Project. Um, part of the prevention efforts that we do when you look at um, what our agency has started engaging in in the last five years is using the public health model. So if you want to think of a famous public health uh, campaign that has changed lives in the time that I, well, I can think of two. One is seatbelts. This is the one we kind of got trained on when we started learning about prevention. In my lifetime, I remember being a kid riding in those big old boat cars and laying myself up there on the top of that little rack that sits in the back of the car and then when the car stopped it was hilarious when you rolled forward and hit the front of the seats. Seat belts were not even thought about but in my lifetime now it's like people won't even turn the key in their car until your seat belts are on, right? That was the public health model is trying to get us all to engage and think about the danger in not clicking our seat belts. Smoking is the other campaign that has received a ton of success when using the public health model. Um, so what we've started to do is we've begun to look at this and say, okay, 
okay, traditionally what has Albion done? We've focused on the individual level. We've looked at families who have already experienced this type of a victimization and we've started to do some intervention work with them. We were doing some minor community level work by going into the schools and doing a single presentation with the schools and um, again, focused mainly on this is what domestic violence is, this is what sexual violence is, um, watch for these red flags and that was it. That was the single presentation that we went in and did with the schools. Um, the public health model is telling us that now we need, to, we need more doses. If we're going to change attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs, then we need more doses. We need to get in front of the kids 10 times. And we need to not just be talking about what is domestic violence and sexual violence, but we need to be talking about um, how does the society support domestic and sexual violence? How does society view dating practices and dating attitudes and we're not just telling the kids what to believe we're asking them questions because they're already the holders of that knowledge they're learning it in the culture that they're soaking in so we're not going to tell them what the answers to those questions are we're going to engage them in a discussion on what the meaning of those questions are so that they're all identifying and they're coming forward and they're literally creating a community of advocates well schools is one strategy that we use. We push that out even further from the schools and now we begin to look at bystander responses. We're not going to solve domestic violence just by addressing the families who are experiencing it. We also have to talk to their neighbors and we have to talk to their churches and we have to talk to their communities um, because all of us are bystanders and by us not interacting, by us not making that call like you said back there in the corner, we are actually supporting domestic violence with our silence by not doing anything as a result of it. So we have to start to have this conversation about why is that? Why do we feel compelled not to call? And there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of research. There's a whole lot of discussion that have brought forward reasons. The strategies then that we adopt is we put up forward um, national campaigns that have been very successful. White Ribbon Campaign engages men specifically and it uses research that shows the reasons why men don't want to step forward and don't want to become involved and it has them doing a pledge. It has them going out and having conversations with other men about it because oftentimes lack of knowledge, right? Well, I don't want to be called out. I don't want anybody. So how do I even begin that conversation and show me a real way to do it. Don't give me the egghead way to do it, right? Show me how real people would have this real conversation, right? So that's what the White Ribbon Campaign is doing. That's what a lot of these national campaigns that we're trying to bring down into the local level. But but a lot of times a national campaign may work in a California or work in a Washington DC. So what our local prevention experts are trying to do is get into the different communities and say, you know, how does this information relate to you and how could we change this message so that when you hear it, you can accept it because it makes sense to you now. It's not something that makes sense in Washington DC or California, but it makes sense right here. One of the things we did several years ago in conjunction with um, USI as we did walk a mile in her shoes. It was our first foray into getting men to kind of take an active role and actually put themselves out visually. We ask college men and men in the community, Bill has done it before in the past, to put on a pair of women's high heel shoes to actually put themselves up there to the potential of ridicule to show that they, um, they, they believe that they hold a piece to this overall um, problem that's happening. And there's been great discussions as that thing has grown and changed and the program with it has changed. And we get a lot of calls from people who participate who now identify a girlfriend or have somebody that they are with who is going through this situation and that they'll go ahead and engage in that next level. That's the kind of discussions that we need to be having um, out in the community and with each other because we all hold pieces to this puzzle and it won't be solved until every single one of us clicks our piece into the puzzle into the larger picture. That's why prevention literally is the strategy is to create an entire community of advocates. Nobody we come across cannot be an advocate. Everybody has the potential to be an advocate because this will touch your life in some way if it hasn't already. Absolutely. Um, I'm 
coming right back to you, Ms. Watson, about you mentioned earlier the secondary victim, mm -hmm. but I, I'm thinking of another victim, and that's the children. Do, does Albion offer any counseling services for the children? Uh, and, and, you know, they're, they're not being abused, but they're watching it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when they've watched it, either they grow up to be abused or yeah. they become abusers. Yeah. So is there, do you work with the children yeah. of these victims that come in what, what do you what do you do with that? Sure, it's a it's a generational cycle, and oftentimes many of the women we work with grew up in homes like this, so we can see that cycle going on. In terms of our shelter program, uh, we do have a child advocate who does all kinds of strategies with the children. We're trying right now. We're doing some research to try and develop what we call 40 developmental assets, which goes with the prevention model, um, which is going to be informing our services even more. But even right now, we're doing safety planning with them. We're connecting them to resources in the community. For children who are 14 and older, we will do peer level counseling since we are a peer model and we're not a therapeutic model. Children younger than 14 are often identified as children who may need more of a therapeutic intervention to help them really begin to pull apart some of the traumatic impact that they've had um, from the situations that they've been living in. So oftentimes we'll refer them to a therapeutic agency and we are very fortunate to have Lampian Center in our area who has therapy that will work with children as young as two, three, and four on play therapy to help them maybe process the physical violence that they may have witnessed, which for a two, three, and four-year-old looks like me hitting my brother now and injuring him because that's what the adults did, so that's what I'm going to do. That is my two, three, and four-year-old understanding of the world around them. Oftentimes when a, a woman is in shelter, she's there for a very short amount of time. So a lot of what our child advocate is doing is trying to place safety um, at a child-appropriate level with the children who are there in shelter because we know that the victim's probably going to return to a situation. She may not be done. Children don't have choices about where they return to. They're just returning to those situation. We've started engaging in doing more parent support groups um, because oftentimes parents have to be advocates for children and um, so educating parents about the impact that domestic violence is having on children goes a long way towards us creating safety based strategies that trickle down from the parents to the children because children in and of themselves until they get old enough to kind of make their own choices can't do a lot to keep themselves safe so we have to make sure that victims are educated about the dangers that children are placed in and the very real impact, even without laying on a hand, the yelling and the screaming can have. There's some incredible studies out right now that have done brain, chem brain scans on babies even to determine the brain chemical changes that happen as a result of witnessing the yelling, the screaming, the arguing, the fighting, and just how dramatically it starts to shift even things we can't see in young, young children. So absolutely. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Yes, I'm what is the common age of most of your victims that you see the most at? Gosh, that's hard. We have such a spectrum. It seems like when I do my stats, the majority of them are between maybe 20 and 45. And some months it's more right there in the yeah. middle. Some, some months it's younger. a little, yeah, some months it's a little younger. We do have a, a, quite a bit of high school students that will come and go since we're in the schools and we're doing strategies in the school. So what does it say of our society? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm with Bill. They come from everywhere. I mean, I run a Monday night support group right now, and I've got two lawyers and a nurse. I've got a director of a center that comes to it. I've got geologists that have come to it. Very well-educated, well-respected women in the community um, who have been through domestic violence situations. Some of them are still in them. Thank you. So um, one thing came to mind, uh, our vice president, Joe Biden, uh, attended a big conference. I believe there were teachers there, law enforcement uh, officers across the country and other, other leaders, and he said that domestic violence is now uh, a public health epidemic. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten so bad that uh, it's titled something different, something other than domestic violence. So as we leave, I would like to ask the panelists just, you know, real briefly, uh, you know, the whole goal of this panel discussion is to bring the conversation forward, is to break the silence. Uh, so I would just ask each of you real briefly to, to tell the audience a little bit of advice.
advice of what you think should be done to break the silence? So we can start with Mary. Well, like, like, like you know, it was talked about before, having more meetings in your churches and your communities, and um, I think um, trying to gather together, I think the, the uh, having more people involved in maybe even the, the, the commission, the Vandenberg Commission, trying to get your ideas out. Get your ideas out. Okay, um, Leslie. Uh, yeah, I would. I would say just speak up and and keep the conversation going. We have so many tools available to us now with social media and Facebook and Twitter, and so sharing information. And when we see stories that do gain some more local attention or some national attention, don't be afraid to be that voice to start the conversation uh, to show that that we're not going to accept this as a community. Absolutely. Yeah. And don't turn a blind eye. I mean, if you suspect that something's going, get whoever you think the victim is alone and plant some seeds. That's how, you know, a garden starts to grow is with those first few suggestions of the possibility, right? Otherwise, the silence continues to let it fester. I think we need to be thoroughly aware of God's standard for marriage, God's standard for <clears throat> what he requires of us as believers to, to intervene with our brothers and sisters. Also, um, to realize that um, nobody's going to change unless they hear the good news of the gospel, accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and then be taught and be taught. And so uh, it's all a matter of prayer. We've got to be very discerning. Um, to know, I love it when they talked about know when to step in because I talked to a lot of women and uh, they're saying one thing and then we live in a day of social media and you see them saying something else. It's like, well, I thought, but here, you know. And so they've got to be consistent so that we'll know and we can discern exactly when to step in, um, exactly how to support and you know, just be prayerful about the whole matter and and. Just like they say, we got to not keep silent. We've got to be brave. It's going to cost us, yeah. and we got to put ourselves out there. It's going to cost us some money, some time. It's going to cost us, and we got to be willing to do that, pay that price. Bill, I think we uh, Brandy hit the nail on the head earlier when she when she talked about getting into the schools and talking to the youth. Uh, you know, I think things like this change at their level. We've got to get to the kids young. Uh, and, and help them to understand that it is not right to uh, to put your hands on another individual in anger. It's just not. It's not right. It's not acceptable. Absolutely. Um, as far as being with the prosecutor's office and what we would need is for people to um, step forward. If you witness something, to, to step forward and, and let us know, um, because that person's not going to change unless there's consequences, and we want to make their consequences for their actions so they start to understand what they've done wrong, um, take responsibility for their actions, and uh, be able to change themselves. Um, so it, stepping up and, and being a witness and um, helping us uh, would go far. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you tomorrow at the play at the Hudson Park Hotel. We have one out here if you want to cut us from by one from off Yeah, if you guys want to uh, get more information oh, from our kind of panels. It's really nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. We had um, at our church, we had a women's uh, we have a women's ministry, and we had you guys come probably about five years ago. Everybody in here will be in the play tomorrow, right? And then we had uh, one of our members trained to be a counselor, yeah. uh, but she moved out of town. Her name oh. was Brenda. Uh, yeah. So we need, you remember Brenda? Uh -huh.